Every Muslim is obligated to complete a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in their life. That is to say, if they are financially and physically capable. This pilgrimage is called the Hajj. It's considered one of the five pillars of Islam, though this is described slightly differently based on your branch of Islam. So for example, for 12 or Shias, it's described as one of their 10 ancillaries of faith. And for Ismaili Shias, they describe it as one of their seven pillars of Islam. Though no matter your branch of Islam, the Hajj is considered one of the most important obligations for Muslims worldwide. The Hajj always occurs over the course of five days during the last month of the Islamic calendar. Now, the Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar, meaning that it's a little bit shorter than the 365-day Gregorian calendar. Because of this, the Hajj always occurs at different times each year. In 2019, it occurs in early and mid-August. In 2020, it will be late July and early August. But the Hajj is way more than just going to Mecca and then going home. It's comprised of a series of rituals, most of them symbolizing important episodes from the life of Abraham and his firstborn son, Ishmael. Now, the backstory of Abraham and Ishmael is a bit different in Islamic tradition compared to Jewish and Christian traditions. For those of you that are familiar with the story from the Hebrew Bible, Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. But in the version in Genesis, Isaac is the favored son as he goes on to be the patriarch of the Israelite people. In Islamic tradition, Ishmael is the favored son and travels to Mecca with his mother Hagar and his father Abraham. And you know that famous story about Abraham almost sacrificing his son Isaac? Well, in Islamic tradition, it's Ishmael who is almost sacrificed by Abraham. So what does the Hajj entail? Before even entering Mecca, you need to enter a ritually pure state called Ihram. This means refraining from sex, refraining from cutting your nails or arguing, wearing perfume or deodorant, and also wearing a special type of pilgrimage clothing. The pilgrimage then starts with walking seven times around the Kaaba, a cube-shaped structure in the Grand Mosque that Muslims believe was rebuilt by Abraham and his son Ishmael after Noah's flood, and in the time of Muhammad, it is said to have become overrun by pagan idols. When Muhammad conquered Mecca, he cleared the Kaaba and rededicated it to the one God. After walking around the Kaaba, the pilgrims then walk or run seven times between two small hills called Safa and Marwa. This ritual reenacts a famous story from Islamic tradition when Abraham leaves Hagar and Ishmael in the desert to test their faith. As their supplies dwindle, Hagar runs between these two hills seven times looking for water for her son until water is miraculously discovered. Today, the route between these two hills is housed entirely in a corridor in the Grand Mosque. After this, pilgrims then move to Mina, a neighborhood right outside of Mecca where the Saudis have built a massive tent city. Here, the pilgrims spend the night in air-conditioned tents before traveling to Mount Arafat. Arafat is said to be the location where Muhammad delivered his final sermon, and pilgrims spend from noon to sunset sunset there in prayer and contemplation. On their way back to Mecca, pilgrims spend the night at Muzdalifa, where they gather 49 stones to perform the stoning of the devil. The stoning of the devil entails throwing seven pebbles at one of three walls. This ritual reenacts an episode in Islamic tradition when the devil tries to tempt Abraham to ignore God's command to sacrifice Ishmael. Abraham resists by throwing stones at the devil. Now, historically, this ritual involved three pillars, but this proves proved pretty dangerous because of the crowds and because people would accidentally get hit by stones. So in the early 2000s, the Saudis replaced the pillars with three walls and constructed a multi-tiered complex to help crowd control. Now, the stoning of the devil occurs on one of the most important festival days of the Islamic calendar, Eid al-Adha, Festival of Sacrifice. After performing the stoning of the devil, pilgrims then slaughter an animal, generally a sheep, to symbolize the sacrifice that God provided as an alternative to sacrificing Ishmael. Muslims worldwide participate in this festival too, sometimes slaughtering a sheep themselves, or sometimes purchasing a voucher for a sheep to be slaughtered in their stead instead of doing the sacrifice themselves. After all of this, the pilgrims then exit the ritual stage of Ihram. Men will shave their hair, women will trim their hair, and they will change out of their pilgrimage clothing. But even though they've exited the sacred state, there's still some pilgrimage left. The pilgrims then return to Mina and then perform the stoning of the devil again, this time throwing seven pebbles at each of the three pillars, before returning once again to the Kaaba to do a farewell circumambulation. So that's a general overview of the Hajj, but here in the 21st century, certain topics come up again and again surrounding the Hajj that we should mention, some logistical and some geopolitical. First, the logistics. 
more and more people are attending the Hajj. In the 1920s, the total pilgrimage numbered fewer than 100,000 people. By the 1970s, it was around 700,000 people. But by 2018, there were over 2 million pilgrims attending the Hajj. This has become a dangerous situation because of the crowds. Every few years, there will be a stampede or a crowd crush where people get killed. One of the most major crowd crushes happened in 2015 when about 2,000 people were killed in Mina near the Stoning of the Devil site. Now, the Saudi government has built all sorts of infrastructure to help alleviate the crowds. They have built the hallways between Safa and Marwa Hills, they built a new bridge to help streamline the stoning of the devil, and they even built a monorail between major sites, but the crowds continue to be a major logistical problem. And then there's some geopolitical challenges. Mecca is located in Saudi Arabia. Therefore, the Saudi government wields a great deal of soft power by being custodians of the Hajj. And even though the Saudis say they want the Hajj to remain apolitical, that has proven to be pretty impossible. So for example, the Saudi government enforces pilgrimage quotas, controlling how many Hajj visas are distributed. So for the countries that don't have diplomatic relations with the Saudi government, such as Syria, obtaining a pilgrimage visa can be very difficult. The Hajj has also been a source of controversy for Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now, these two countries are geopolitical adversaries, and they've been waging a cold war or proxy war in the Middle East for years. Moreover, Iran is majority Shia, while Saudi Arabia is majority Sunni. So this conflict runs across sectarian lines as well. Following the 2015 crowd disaster, Iranians boycotted the 2016 Hajj and criticized the Saudis for incompetence. The supreme leader of Iran even insinuated that the crowd collapse was premeditated, calling the Saudis heartless and murderous for failing to protect pilgrims. The Saudis responded by calling Iranians pagan fire worshippers, which is a derogatory term for Zoroastrians, the religion that has its roots in ancient Iran. So the Hajj can expose some of the same political rifts that we see around the world. But, geopolitics aside, for the average Muslim, completing the Hajj is one of the most important things you can do in your lifetime, and it remains a monumental, unifying experience for the second largest religion in the world. As always, thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and I'll see you next time.